this morning, Lord. We thank you for every person that has come here today, Lord. And Lord, you, <clears throat> you know their hearts, Lord, and you know maybe they're going through things in their marriage or maybe they're going through things as a single person. But Lord, we just believe that whatever is spoken today by your spirit, Lord, that it will be a help um, and that your word will not return void. But Father, it will accomplish what it was sent to accomplish in Jesus' name, Lord. We thank you, Father. We just commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, timer is going. Okay, so today we're talking about communication and marriage. Uh, the week before last, we were talking about covenant, and the week before that, we were talking about dating. And any of those teachings, you can get them on YouTube if you want to listen. Sometimes it's good to listen to things more than once. It says, faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. So we need to hear the word of God more than once. We need to hear it many times. So uh, today I'm, I'm talking to you obviously as a woman, and so the way, the way I'm thinking is, is as a woman, um, and so Pastor John will, will give you his, his as a man. So, but we are very, wired very differently, men and women. Does anyone relate to that, that we're wired completely differently, <laughs> actually? But this, uh, this is really good, because um, it means that when we come together, there's two very different things. We, we form a whole. So what's lacking in one area will be made up in the other area and vice versa. So it's a, he it's a healthy, positive thing. It's not a negative thing. But in order to have good communication, it's very vital that w these two wor worlds are coming together. It's very vital that we have good communication because of this, because of the differences that we have. Because, you know, husbands and wives, you can't read your husbands and wives' minds. You have to speak, you have to verbally, you know, say what's going on through your head, okay? Um, actually, sorry, did we, our drama team, we forgot about the drama. Our drama team here, there's just so much going on today. Okay, so we'll have our drama team, I, before I go on, I'm sorry, before I go on, I think the drama team is going to just give us a little illustration uh, about good communication, <laughs> so please welcome them, they've been working very hard. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of this room. 
I'm tired of your mess. I'm tired of your face. <laughs> she just had a horrible day and she just wants a cup of tea. <laughs> T is a very good idea right now and he should probably get it for her. What's wrong with you? Nothing. He just really doesn't get up. This is exactly what I'm talking about. You're so confused, you don't get you. He really, really doesn't understand her. It's not his fault. You know what? Forget it. Now would be a good time for him to stop her from leaving the room, get her some flowers, get her some gifts worth a hundred quid and just say I love you. What he really means is, I love you. Thanks. <laughs> Not fine. Of course she wants to talk about it. I quit. Let's go to the next Thank you. Sorry guys, I had forgotten. Can anyone relate to that? Yes. <laughs> well, we know Abel, you know, he did a great job in interpreting, but it was, fun, it was funny, it was humorous, but in fact, it, it was true. And um, we need to ra realize that we have the Holy Spirit as our interpreter. If husbands, you don't understand your wives, say, Holy Spirit, you help me. <laughs> And vice versa. So we have the power of the Holy Spirit. In John 14, verse 26, it says that he's our helper. He's our advocate. So that's encouraging. Well, you know, our aim as couples in our, in our lives is to bring our communication level from, from good up to excellent. And that's going to be a lifetime journey. But by the grace of God, we can do it. You know, it's a skill that's developed over time. It does not happen overnight because it takes you a long time to get your, to know your husband. Um, and, you know, as I was preparing for this this, this last week, um, I really realized how I fell short in a lot of areas in, in, in relation to communication. And that's good because we, if we're not aware of it, well, then we're never going to desire to improve. So it's good when the Holy Spirit convicts you and says, you know, you need to work on this area a little bit more. Well, you know, work on it by the power of the Spirit. So, um, so godly communication is speaking the truth in love. Now, we saw there, it, it was the, maybe it was the truth, but it wasn't spoken in love. It, wa it wasn't with a good attitude. So it's not only just what we say. Communication isn't just about what we're saying, but it's actually how we say it is vitally important. Because, you know, our words are powerful. Um, Proverbs uh, 16, verse 24, if we can just turn there. We'll be looking at a few scriptures in Proverbs this morning. Um, I had the timer going all the time during the dramas on, so now I'm confused. But anyway, I will get a hand signal from my husband when he wants me to stop. Proverbs 16, verse 24 says, Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. You know, I've often seen people who have been abused verbally, who've had been, wrote, words have been spoken to them that have damaged them. It actually affects their health. It affects them physically. And so we have to be very on guard about the words that we speak to one another because it, it has an effect. You know, it says that six and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, they do hurt. They do hurt and they, do, they can break you. So it's important that, you know, we know the Word of God and we regularly remind ourselves of these things. So words are containers of blessings and they're containers of curses as well. So we have to choose every day when we get up what words we're going to use to our husband and wife. And sometimes just being quiet is the best option. <laughs> I don't mean the silent treatment. I just think if you feel something rise up on the inside of you and it's going to be contentious, just quench it back down there. <laughs> Um, so the words that we speak, we need to think about what we're thinking about before it comes out of our mouths. And that takes discipline. It takes self-control. Uh, it, it takes the fruit of the Spirit. So the first thing I want to encourage you this, this morning is be conscious of your words. Are they words of encouragement? Are they words of respect? And, you know, if you're, uh, you know, we have different personalities in the room. Everyone here is quite different. But if you're a perfectionist, which... 
I am, unfortunately. I'm always looking for something to improve. In the church, if I see something that's wrong, I immediately just want to fix it. And I'm a bit like that in my relationship with, with my husband. You know, if there's something wrong, I want to try and fix it. Instead of just, you know, just enjoying my husband, encouraging my husband, I, I see, oh, this, 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 you know. And so, you know, we have to be conscious that we are there to encourage our husbands because husbands thrive on encouragement, not on negativity, you know, not nagging and all those things. So, you know, uh, he always expresses his feelings and emotions very easily to me, but I find it hard to do that. But then there's other areas um, that I, I'm, I'm about probably communicate better. I like to talk more and discuss things and work things out more than he would. So when we come together, you know, we've got a good synergy going and, and it's, it means that, you know, we're, we're moving together in the same direction. But if we're, we're negative and we're, you know, nagging each other and not honoring one another, you know, it's, it's communication just breaks down right there and then. So um, when we come together and we bring our communicative abilities together, then we're there, we help one another. And that's what one of the things that, uh, in a marriage, a partner, is that we're helpmates. We're there to help one another. And um, the second one then is body language. We saw that there this morning, um, you know, Eleni had her arms folded and her eyes kind of slanted and the hands kind of on the hips and this. So when, we, when we're communicating with our husbands and wives, be very conscious of your body language. What signals are you sending out to your husband or your wife? You know, because sometimes you can be sending a signal even before you speak a single word, and that's not a good thing. And, you know, we all have our own signature um, signature <laughs> moves or, or body language. Like he, Pastor John always says, you always kind of stick your head out and you, your eyes. And I said, well, you always do this with your eyes. <laughs> we all have our own little, little ones that we know, but, you know, we just, let's try and not use those things. <laughs> so the third one um, is... Our tone, you know, how do we, uh, the tone again, sorry lady for using you, this is, this is part of <laughs> why we had the drama, but you know, the tone was very kind of condescending, and, uh, you know, and so, um, you know, when we communicate with our husband or wife, how is our tone? Is it tinged with anger? Is it tinged with blame? Is it tinged with manipulation, ladies? Because that's a favor for ladies, for ladies, we like to manipulate using our emotions. Has anyone ever been there? You manipulate a little bit with your emotions, how you're feeling well. You know, I believe that, um, you know, that's not, that's not a very godly thing. And we need to be aware of that too. You know, I, fortunately, I'm not a very terribly emotional person. But there have been times where I know I have done that over the years. So we need to be able to communicate with clarity and honesty. Because manipulation is actually a form of deceit. Because you are deceiving your husband. Because you want him to go your way. Because you're not happy. And so you use your emotions and, and you get huffy and whatever. Uh, and then he's like, oh, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. No, no, no. No, we have to avoid, have to avoid those things at all costs. So, you know, sometimes we're, we're better to wait until we're composed and our head is clear you know go off for a walk do a few breathing exercises or whatever you want to do to, and just just compose yourself fourth thing um it's really good to, when you're communicating to wait for an opportune time to communicate you know as as women sometimes we can be impulsive if something's in our brain we just want to get it straight out there so husband walks through the door you'll never guess what happened today <laughs> you know so we have to avoid that we need to try and uh, remember he's just come in from work he's tired you know wait till the kids are in bed because the kids don't need to hear about what you're going to discuss and um, because when the timing is wrong it can be an absolute disaster so Proverbs 15, verse 23, it says, A man has joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. So let our words be spoken in the right time, in good season, and it'll have a better effect. Um, and also another good thing to do as well is to pray together before you're going to discuss something that could be inflammatory. If you know it's going to be something, it's something to do with the kids that you know, you're not in agreement with, or finances, pray together before you... Um, discuss it and that that helps um, so you know we need to get rid of that mentality I just want to get it off my chest because you want to get it off your chest so you can feel better then you dump it on him and he's stressed and we haven't prayed or thought about it and then we re we end up in this full full-blown uh, argument you know we want God's thoughts about everything that we do and wisdom, as I, t I mentioned before in dating, that wisdom is not in a rush. Wisdom is, is learning not to be impulsive. It's learning to wait for the right moment. In Proverbs 25, verse 11, it says that a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. And so 
I really believe as, as uh, husbands and wives, one of the most necessary fruits of the spirit that we must develop in our lives is the fruit of self-control. Um, you need it when, you're, when you get married, but you need it also when you have kids. When you're in a ministry, you need, self, you need self-control. So, you know, we need, we need to allow these circumstances that we're going through. Don't see them as a negative thing. Oh, our marriage is in tatters. You know, we're always fighting. No, listen, you have to work, your, work through your, your issues, through your pro- problems, and realize that through them, God is building you up. He's, tr- he's developing the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Because if everything was fine, you, you, there would be no opportunity for you to put those things into practice. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the fifth thing is that you need to communicate very regularly. Don't allow things to bottle up on the inside. And you know, women I think can be quite good at that, bottling things up. Um, it, you know, you either have the explosive, you know, attitude where I was going to tell him right now because I want to get off my chest or else you bottle it up and internally let it fester um, and then things don't go the way you want. You know, we need to work on our buttons. Do you know what buttons are? Yes, everybody has a button that you can press and that button will just trigger something and it's like World War Three. So developing the fruits of the spirit helps take the sting out of those buttons you know what i'm saying it takes the sting so they don't have the effect that they used to have okay um you know there's practical things that we can do for each other and if we have the mindset that we're there to bless and encourage and help the other person the the communication can only get better but if, it's, if you have it, it's, it's about me and my feelings and what I want, then communication isn't going to go the right way, you know. So the next thing then is have regular nights out or walks out or time together, just you and your husband, where you have less distractions. Maybe if you have kids, it's, it's, it's less distracting, less noisy, a more relaxed environment to talk to one another. Because women like romance and women love when you talk to them and when you talk to them you don't do as James is just gazing at his his phone you make eye contact does everyone know what eye contact is yes you look at them in the eye like you did when you first met them all those years ago and you kept staring in their eyes well you keep looking in their eye and you talk to them you focus and you show that you care Women love when you spend time with them and you talk about them. Talk about them. Sorry, talk to them. <laughs> and then at night time, when the kids are in bed, things are much more easy for the, the woman. She's just as happy and she's happy in the bedroom. Um, I won't go any further there. Um, <clears throat> you know, ask your husband and wife, how was their day? How was their week? Don't become so over busy with each other uh, with, 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 with life that you don't have time for each other just to ask those little, little things. You know, women obviously are naturally better, as I said, at, at talking. And that's why coffee, coffee shops are full of women nattering at the top of their voices and very few men. He doesn't understand the whole coffee shop thing. He doesn't drink coffee, doesn't drink tea, doesn't talk about his feelings. But women love to do that. So just, just indulge. Just indulge them and, and do it. Just nod. Yes, yes, I understand. It's wonderful. Yes, yes. Keep, just keep it, keep it going. But you know, men on the inside, they love to internalize. They, they're just, they're men. You know, you don't need to talk about, why would you talk about your feelings? You just, you just internalize and you just work it out yourself. And it's like the woman can't understand that, you know. So maybe women, you need to understand that too, that men like to do that. But men certainly need to be encouraged to communicate more. Okay, the next thing is you need to become a good listener. Listening is a huge part of a communication. Has any of you ever sat down with your husband or wife and one of you starts talking and then the other person is not listening and they're thinking about the response that they're going to give to their husband or wife while they're talking because they're not in agreement and they're thinking about the words that they're going to speak. Does anyone ever do that? Well, that's not listening and that's not healthy. We need to listen and we need to focus on what they're saying. You know, when your husband or wife's there, just put away the phone. Put away the phone. In uh, James 1.19, it says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be slow, sorry, swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. So there's a little progression there. 
you know, if you are slow to speak, you will be slow to wrath. So that means you're paying attention to what you're speaking. And also it says you're being swift to hear. So you, you hear, you're, then you're slow to speak, and then there's slow to wrath. Wrath doesn't come into it. Um, but, you know, sometimes we jump into situations before we find out the full facts because we want to get our last word. Pastor John says it to me, says, why do you always like to get the last word? I do. I have to say, I do love getting in the last word. But, you know, praise the Lord. The Lord's, oh, I'm flashing. The red light's flashing. <laughs> Let me just finish. Um, you know, but well, let's not be like that. Let's think, you know, we're a team. We're, we're working together. We're not working against one another, okay? So if something affects your husband, it affects you and vice versa. Um, Listening shows that you care, but it also shows that you're wise. Listening is, is, is wisdom. The next one then is, if there's no communication, there'll be no intimacy. If you don't talk to one another, then romance is dying in your marriage. You, how can you even progress into your future together if you can't discuss things? If you can't discuss the plans, the visions, what's on your heart, what you're doing? You know, when you're single... You can work things out by yourself and with the Lord's and with the Lord. But when you get married, you, you have to remember there's someone else there with you. There's three of you. There's a threefold cord. It's, the, it's you, the husband, and the Lord. And so you have to remember, you have to lose the sight sometimes of your selfish uh, desires and just lay them down. You know, there's sometimes, Pastor John will want to do something, and I'm like, I really do not want to do it. But because I know he wants to do it, I'll say, okay. And, and, it hap and the same you know, both ways. Usually I get my way a bit more. <laughs> um, but the foundation of your marriage is it's, it's based on friendship. So, you know, your husband or your wife should be your best friend. You know, it shouldn't be another, you know, if it's a woman, it shouldn't be another girl. If it's a guy, it shouldn't be another guy. You know, they are your best friend. And, you know, we've always been really good at talking, you know, to each other. You know, as, as the years have got on with the kids and ministry, it, it's more of a fight to, to, to make that time to talk. But we love talking to one another. Um, then the next one is, if you're, um, uh, you're from a different country and you're married to somebody who's a different language and a different culture, you have to work extra hard to communicate. Uh, can anyone identify with that? <laughs> if you're married to somebody who's not from your country, who doesn't have the same language as you, you have to work harder because linguistically, you don't share the same language. And so you have to spell things out more clearly. And it's a good idea as well just to get to know that person's culture a little bit more. Not the culture should deter de should. Um, rule your, your marriage, but it should make you have a better understanding of where they're coming from. Okay, and that will help you understand each other better. And finally, communication is fun. Can everybody say it? Communication is fun. It should never become boring to spend time with your best friend. So don't see communication as always addressing a problem or an issue. It's not. It's a time where you can just have fun together, build each other up, and allow God to just change your hearts as you, as you communicate with each other. And I'd encourage you for your homework. Boys and girls, men and women. James 3. I, I think you should, we should all study that chapter about the power of our words. I'm not going to read it. I don't have time. But just to go home and just look over James 3 and, and just challenge yourself with, with that, with what, what words you're speaking as husbands and wives. So praise the Lord. I'm finished. Pastor John is coming now. <laughs> And so we'll have questions and answers. Um, so if any people are watching on online, you can send in the questions and answers in relation to, not answers, sorry, we're giving the answers, questions related to communication. Amen. Isn't she wonderful? Just make sure you put your timer on there. Come on, get it on. <laughs> Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, thank you for that wonderful drama. I have to say, watching that drama, I came to the conclusion, you know, uh, James and Alini should never have been married. <laughs> they actually weren't married, so. Um, <clears throat> praise the Lord. But anyway, um, so we're talking about communication uh, just before we get it, I just want to briefly recap. The first week we dealt with foundations, and um, 
with regards to marriage, uh, you know, singleness, dating, etc. And um, I, I thought it would be good to, to remind ourselves of the four W's. Um, you know, if you want to find success uh, either in marriage or ministry or career, um, I believe the four W's are essential. And, and the first one, every day, you need to do these four W's. What was the first one? Wash. Wash yourself. Have a shower. Your, your, your chances of finding somebody just escalate hugely when you do that, okay? And um, the second one is worship. Worship God. Uh, the third one is, you know, study the Word of God. You know, uh, you know the, the Word of God has to be the foundation of everything you do. And uh, the fourth thing is work. If you want to find somebody, you should have a job. You should uh, work. Amen. You know, I was talking to my dear friend Kwame. We've been friends for nearly 20 years. And um, he's been with us, you know, even when we were youth pastors. I was his youth pastor, even though he's the same age as me. But, um, you know, wonderful man. And, you know, he's exemplified this to me, this, this principle of work. Because, um, you know, he's, he said to me yesterday, and he really struck me. He said, you know, Abraham was blessed, but he wasn't lazy. Uh, same with Jacob. You see these men, they were workers. Paul the Apostle was a worker. He, he built tents. He, you know, they, and they brought that attitude and that worth ethic, ethic to the kingdom of God. And because of that, they were blessed. You know, when Kwame came here first to Ireland all the way from Ghana, um, he was here in a, 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 um, the visa he had, he was tied into Dublin Airport. So every day he worked from 3 a.m. until 11 a.m. in the kitchen, cooking sausages and uh, doing all that in the kitchen. He did that for five years. At the end of the five years, he was free to go where he wanted. And, um, you know, he's been working in, in Dublin Airport all these years since. But, um, you know, he's a worker. I was just talking to him yesterday. I was struck. Even during the summer, he was doing three 16-hour shifts day after day. Simply because he's, he's supporting his family. And he has that attitude. And I think we have to bring that to the kingdom of God. And, you know, I think, the, you know, the kingdom of God suffers um, due to laziness. Let's be honest, I, I, in my opinion, I, I look at some other religions and I see them being much more diligent about their faith than Christians and that, that convicts me and it makes me uncomfortable. Um, you, you know, with regard to evangelism or prayer or any of these other issues, I see Christ, non-Christians that are much more diligent in serving their God uh, than Christians are and I think that shouldn't be the case, okay? So anyway, the, the, last week we looked at covenant and the importance of that, so I encourage you. The messages are on YouTube if you want to just, you know, to, to let those truths permeate your spirit and really build them into your heart. So, you know, this week we're talking about communication and, you know, uh, Joanna just, I, I think, perfectly summed the that up, um, and I'd encourage you, like I said, to go through that again during the week. But anyway, um, you know, there's a story about one day uh, God and Adam were uh, walking the Garden of Eden, and God said to Adam, Adam, it's now time to repopulate the earth. And um, so anyway, he said to Adam, you can start by kissing Eve. And uh, what's a kiss, asked Adam. Uh, God explained, and then Adam took Eve behind the bush, and he kissed her. Adam returned with a big smile on his face, said, that was great, Lord, what's next? And um, so God says, now Adam, you must caress Eve. What's a caress, God, said Adam. And God explained, so Adam took Eve behind the bush and uh, lovingly caressed her. Adam returned with an even bigger smile, and he said, Lord, that's even better than a kiss. What's next? Well, now listen carefully, said God to Adam. Here is how you make babies. Now I want you to make love to Eve. What's make love, asked Adam. So God patiently explained, and then he took, uh, Adam took Eve behind the bush. A few seconds later, Adam returned and said, Lord, what's a headache? <laughs> Maybe a little risque for Sunday morning, but hey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Genesis 2 verse 18 says it's not good that a man let's not be religious okay hallelujah amen God designed it so that's okay so God designed it but uh, Genesis 2 verse 18 says it's not good that a man should be alone we were not made to be alone and God himself acknowledged this fact from the very beginning 
Because even though Adam was in a literal paradise, amen, he was surrounded by beauty and abundance, and yet it was not perfect as long as he was alone. And this is why God made Eve. You know, Adam was rich and he was powerful. He was blessed by God. He lacked for nothing. And yet he was lonely because, you know, in spite of all of the authority, the prestige and the wealth that God had bestowed upon him, um, he had no one to share his happiness, his hopes and his dreams with. And this is why we see that God made uh, Eve and um, Genesis chapter 3 records, um, you know, the, the, tragically the, the fall of mankind into sin. And um, Satan came, said, has God indeed said? And um, obviously they listened to the devil. Uh, Satan contradicted God. Has God, has God said? And you know, that's the old lie that, you know, down through the ages, Satan has perpetuated that lie to so many believers. You don't really believe that, do you? You know, and he's always looking to sow doubt into your heart and to get you to doubt God's word and, you know, God's purpose for your life. But it says, uh, they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the eight, verse eight. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And God said to Adam, where are you? He said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, you should not eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And so we see this um, recorded for, for all of eternity. Um, in the beginning, man and woman walked with God. And so we see we were designed for communication because communication starts with our creator. We were designed to communicate with him. Amen. And um, so we were designed for, for communication. God communicates with us. We communicate with God and we communicate with each other. And yet after the fall of Adam and Eve, we see the very first thing um, that happens is there's a breakdown in communication. Um, because Adam hides from God, and then, uh, not just that, he blames Eve. Plus, he blames God for giving him Eve. All my problems started when she turned up. And, um, you know, how many men have taken that attitude down through the years? It's the age-old lie. We always want to pass the blame. The blame. And um, But ultimately, you know, all of our problems started when Adam and Eve listened to Satan's lies. Amen? Because, you know, who you communicate with is... is uh, you know, very, very important. And you could say that so much of the heartache in our world today is caused by issues with communication, whether it's misunderstanding or, or hatred or racism or prejudice uh, or, or divorce. You know, even wars are fought by people who have not tried to understand each other. Amen? You know, so it's tragically, I think, to see so many good marriages fail that didn't have to. Um, you know, marriages that could have made it if only they could have learned to communicate effectively with each other. And so, again, just like the drama shows us here, you know, throwing plates or throwing insults isn't communication. Uh, or at least it's not the right form of communication. It is giving a message, I guess, of sorts. But, um, you know, uh, but, but in the same way, um, neither is maintaining a, a, a dignified silence as you watch your marriage slowly die. That's, that's not good communication either. You need to talk because the thing to understand is this. In marriage, you know, conflict is inevitable, but communication is optional. And I think this is the thing we need to understand because in this life, you can't avoid conflict and disagreement. But you can avoid true communication and sadly, many couples do. Amen. You know, and, uh, you know, in light of their failure to communicate, you know, uh, many couples just end up being imprisoned by hurt and disappointment and bitterness. And, you know, uh, they, they, many times they hide behind children or careers or hobbies or causes. But, uh, you know, uh, they end up being no more than intimate strangers. Um, because even though they're living together, they never truly talk. And this is why communication is so vital, um, because in many instances, couples simply learn to tolerate each other. And I don't believe that's the way it should be. I think we should celebrate each other, amen? So it's not about tolerating each other um, or just communicating on a mere superficial level. 
Um, because, you know, at that level, I mean, at that stage, I believe the writing is on the wall for that particular marriage because, you know, communication is oxygen to the fire that burns at the heart of every um, uh, marriage relationship, okay? So, you're sitting here today, you may feel that there's no hope or no future or no way forward for you and your spouse. But let me say this, successful marriages are built by those who choose to put their vows before their feelings, so let's put our feelings to the side and let's see what does God's word actually say with regards to this. So, you know, how do we avoid, you know, becoming just another statistic and, and start to improve our communication with each other? Well, I, I believe there are a number of keys. Joanna has touched on some of them because uh, this is the beautiful thing is the longer you're married, the more you, you start to think like each other. Amen. And um, so she's stolen uh, some of the message, but that's okay because um, I love her. So the first one to do is uh, keys to effective communication. First one, listen. And um, you know, when we think of all the means of communication open to us today, whether speaking, email, shouting, you know, uh, Skype, uh, phone, uh, so many forms of uh, social media. I mean, you could do something radical, like even write a letter. Um, yeah, you could also include nonverbal forms of communication, like Joanna showed, uh, body language, a kiss, an embrace, a smile. Um, and yet, sadly, so many of us don't automatically think of listening when we think of communication. And yet, it's an absolutely vital aspect of communication. James 1.19, know this, my brothers, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. You know, that may seem like a paradox, um, because we only think to, uh, of communication from our own perspective, having our say. You know, getting, like Joanna said, getting it off your chest. But that's part of the problem, is that we're not listening to the other person or getting their perspective. And you know, this refusal to listen often leads to an escalation of, of, of tension, um, strife, misunderstanding, hurt, and ultimately even divorce. Because you know, if you're not listening to, to each other, you're not getting closer, you're growing farther apart. And um, so, you know, a, a woman can't connect in a marriage without words. And a man can't connect in a marriage without sex. And uh, this is why we need to listen to each other. Because again, uh, you know, our respective needs are different and our, our respective pers perspectives are different. You know, for men, intimacy is a pathway to sex. And for women, sex is a pathway to intimacy. And so you could say that we're different, um, but that's okay. So, so we need to, to listen to each other. So, uh, and again, in order to listen effectively, we must foster an environment of grace in our marriage and in our home. Uh, that means we're quick to forgive, and um, it, it also means that we acknowledge our God-given differences. You know, because th these differences affect our preferences, our perspectives, and our responses. Genesis 1, 26. In the beginning, God made them male and female. Personally, I think some of the battles that we're going to be seeing in these days to come, and we're presently seeing them um, in our society, is not a division between black and white, or, or east or west, or, um, but ultimately, uh, you know, a division between those who recognize boundary boundaries and those who don't. You know, whether those boundaries are borders, or whether those boundaries are the dis distinctions between male and female, and, and uh, you know, the, the, uh, everything that follows on from that, from, from acknowledging that difference, it's, it's, it's important for us to understand that, because, uh, you know, boundaries are there by God. You know, uh, you, so, like I said, you have national boundaries, gender boundaries, moral boundaries. Um, we're living in a society where many people no longer want to, uh, to recognize, uh, you know, absolute truth. But I believe there's boundaries between right and wrong, defined not by man or by courts, but by God. So again, uh, you know, boundaries are very relevant um, to us. So we start with this uh, premise, men and women are different. And um, so, you know, many young couples are, are, are frustrated because they're trying in vain to make their spouse think and respond in the same way as them. So here's a little secret. They never will. Uh, a man and a woman are different by design. That'd be a good place to say amen. Because we're living in a society where you're being brainwashed constantly to try and think that we're not. Um, you know, but we are different by design. Gender is not some sort of a construct. It is defined by God. We're, from the womb, we're different. So we need to stop the ideological brainwashing 
and respect our God-given differences. You know, at times my wife has spoken to me um, before she was going out somewhere. She always gives some parting wisdom before she leaves. And she says, John, make sure that you blah, 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 blah. And I'm nodding. And half an hour later or an hour later, I think, oh, what did she say to me? <laughs> because most married men, no, let's, let's generalize. All married men have learned this skill of nodding your head and continuing to do what you're doing. Um, uh, so you're nodding and she thinks you're hearing her. You're not. Ladies, like Joanna said, if he's not looking in your eye and if he hasn't stopped doing what he's doing. Because just a secret. Women run on broadband. Men are dial up. We, we, we can just do one thing at a time. And that's why some of the greatest artists and cooks and, and you know, uh, musicians and, y- y- have been men. Because we, we, you know, we have this obsessive ability to focus intensely on one thing. Whereas many times women can do like 15. You know, my wife, is, she's stirring the food. She's doing the homework. She's on the phone. And she's, you know, she's kicking one of the kids up the rear end. It's amazing to watch her. So men and women have different abilities. So again, if he's still doing what he's doing while you're giving directions, he can only do one thing. So his head is nodding, but he's just got one thing. He's not hearing a word you're saying, ladies. Okay. So um, (laughs) he's not like you. He can't do many things together. He can do one thing. And ladies, I want to try and keep it some way even. You need to listen to your husband and at least let him finish his sentence. Okay. (laughs) Hallelujah. So listen. The second one is learn. Um, How can we improve our communication? Don't assume that you know it all or that you always understand each other because many times we don't because we actually speak a different language and a lot gets lost in translation. And that's why many of us, when we got first married, it was, it was this shock of my God, you know, who has, who has possessed my wife? I mean, the, the, this, this person I went out on dates with and it was so much fun. And now she's, it's like, wh- what is happening here? And she's thinking the same of you. You mean, she said, who, who is that guy sleeping in the bed next to me? I mean, because we're different. So we have to learn. And uh, so here's some wrong assumptions women make about men. And again, I don't want to generalize, but I believe it will help some of you. First one is this, like I've already touched on it, men and women are the same. That is not true. I mean, when were feminists ever right about anything? Um, So unless you begin with this premise, um, ultimately any conclusion you arrive at will will be wrong. It will be wrong. Because we are equal, but we are very different. We're equal in value, but different in ability. Um, let me just throw this out here. Men can't have babies. Be offended by bi- biology if you want. But it's, it's, well, I read in the paper about this man who had, that was a confused woman. <laughs> just because you're a woman, call yourself a man, doesn't magically make you one or vice versa. God ordained the distinction between the sexes. And there's no amount of ideology or courts or, or, or you know, uh, or, or governments or, or anything else can change this fact. And as the church, we have to stick with the word of God because we're in a society right now that has unleashed itself from all reality in many respects and is trying to pretend things that are that aren't. Okay, so, and that's not meant to offend or hurt anybody, but again, let's deal with reality and not ideology. I think this is important. So, um, you know, men can't have babies. And, uh, you know, there's things that men can do that women can't do. And it's, it's not about being sexist or putting women down or putting men down. It's just recognizing God gives us different abilities. Um, so, again, you, you know, our, our schools have bought into this lie. And this is why, in many respects, boys are being treated as defective girls. And they're going to be, I believe, going to be some major consequences for our society down the road as a result of our educators and our academics buying into this lie that, you know, men and women are the same. And therefore, when boys aren't performing a certain way or girls aren't performing a certain way, we have to, you know, make them. And uh, so you can't do that because you can't let ideology blind you to biology. And remember, biology, uh, sometimes people think, oh, science and faith don't mix. Yes, they do. Because God ultimately is the the one who's ordained all of these laws, you know, whether in biology or science or any of these aspects, physics, etc. God is the one who put them in place. So we must understand this. And and, um, anyway, uh, hallelujah. Uh, So the, the next one is this. Men don't have feelings. 
men act tough, okay? Uh, because we're told since we're little boys, you know, big boys don't cry, uh, you know, man up. And, and, and I'm not saying that we want to, all we want to do is have a, a good cry and a cuddle, because we don't. Um, <laughs> we don't, seriously. Uh, but underneath the tough exterior, most men have fragile egos. And, um, you know, ladies, you can make your husband feel like a champion or a loser. I, I, you know, I think it's important to understand this, okay? And um, so just because men are not as comfortable in talking about their feelings as women doesn't mean that they don't have them. So ladies, mind your tongue because you can speak words that, that you can't, that you regret later, but you can't take back. And, and vice versa for men. You can speak words that you regret, but you can't re re take those words back. So again, Proverbs 14.1, a wise woman builds her home, but a foolish one tears it down with her own hands. I would add to that verse, her own tongue. You can tear down your marriage with your tongue through the words you're speaking. Bitter words. Amen. Um, the contemporary English version, a woman's family is held together by her wisdom, but it can be destroyed by her foolishness. So again, you can be speaking foolish words. You know, it's your husband. You're such a muppet. You're such a moron. Why, why do you always do this? Uh, you know, disrespectful, etc. So, you know, ladies, your words may wound him far more than he is willing to let on. So please choose your words carefully because you can end up prophesying your own future and literally cursing your marriage with your own words. And I would say the same thing to the men. Okay, so another one is this, men don't want to talk. It's a scientific fact that we don't talk near as much as women. But men do talk, but not, not, not in the same way as women do. There's one study in 2013 found women use an average of 20,000 words a day compared to a mere 7,000 for men. And this is part of the problem because at the end of the day, he's used up all of his words and you're only getting warmed up. He's, he's just out of words. It's not personal. He's just out of words, <laughs> you know? And um, so, again, I appreciate you don't feel like talking at the end of the day. You're tired, and it's easier to relax by just turning on the TV and sitting there in silence like a vegetable in a string vest. But what I would simply say is this. Your silence to her feels more like rejection than relaxation, Okay? So it, you need to bear that in mind as a man. So, and, and in the same way, when a woman says to a man, we need to talk, alarm bells goes off in his head and he braces himself for a lecture. You know? So again, um, he, he doesn't realize that she needs to talk and he doesn't realize that, she, that he needs to walk. Uh, what I mean, is, and again, Joanna touched on it earlier, is a woman is quite content uh, you know, to sit in a cafe, drink green tea, uh, have, uh, you know, have a bit of a cry, talk about her feelings. Um, wh whereas a man finds it easier to communicate while he's doing something like walking on a golf course, fixing a car, shooting an innocent animal, uh, you know, doing something. <laughs> so over the years, we've learned to walk and talk. And um, it's amazing when you relax how easy it is to talk. You know, because look to men, the cafe thing feels more like an interrogation or an interview. Um, so it's, it's easier to just walk or drive or talk and just fellowship with each other. You know, 1 Peter 3, 7, in the same way, husbands, give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she's your equal partner in God's gift of life. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. You see, you both have a God-given responsibility to learn about your spouse. And over the years, we've learned from each other, and we've learned not to make broad assumptions about each other. Amen? So we've learned to pick our time to communicate. It's not advisable when you're tired, stressed, or busy. Okay, so for Joanna, um, I know not to communicate with her before 10 o'clock um, in the morning. She knows not to connect, talk to me after 9 o'clock at night because I could manifest. It's just, it's not personal. I'm just not a night person. I don't want to see anybody. I, I don't want to talk to anybody after 9. I just want to go to bed. Okay, so, um, and, and, and again, man, help in the kitchen if you want some heat in the bedroom. Let me just throw it out there. It's easier to talk when you've got all of the other stuff out of the way. Okay? So sometimes, again, the most spiritual thing you can do is just go to bed and deal with your issues in the morning. 
Because you can literally start World War III by not being sensitive as to when to communicate with each other about contentious issues. I appreciate it may be important, but can it wait until the morning? Okay, Proverbs 25, 11, a word spoken at the right time is like golden apples on a silver tray. So, you know, timing is everything. The New American Standard says apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. You need to choose your moment and also choose your battles. Don't be fighting over things that are irrelevant at the end of the day. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Ephesians chapter 5. We don't have time to go there, but read over it. As a husband, love uh, learn to learn your, love your wife. We're talking about learning. You know, and this doesn't come automatically. This is a slow process. It takes patience, determination, and humility to learn. But if you are willing, then you can become a better communicator and have a happy marriage. So the first one was listen. The second one, learn. The third one, laugh. You know, Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Okay, so you need to have some fun together. I'm not talking about going away in a stag or a hen or going to Vegas. Um, you know, go for a walk, um, get dinner, watch a movie, watch a, watch a romantic comedy. Um, <laughs> it's, it's very difficult for us to try. I, I, I want to watch something with cars exploding and people falling out of there and she looks just this is completely mindless i said yeah it is it's great and um, she wants to something you know how do you feel oh how do you feel oh do, and you're like god will this thing ever end please shoot me put me out of my misery um but you got to do something to laugh together okay so um and you know go for dinner if, if things are tight then you you know get a takeaway and, and and light a candle just make the moment special and laugh the early years of my marriage, um, my wife couldn't cook to save her life. Uh, dinners are pretty bad. Uh, but you know what? She always had a candle and a smile and I was in heaven. Yeah, you. Yeah. Don't be interrupting me. But she, seriously, from four o'clock every evening, she was on the phone to her mother trying to get directions. You know, how, mom, how do you boil an egg? Uh, you know. I was <laughs> checking out. Uh, moving along swiftly, uh, nothing to see here, folks. Uh, but, but she, I mean, she was learning. I was learning. We were all learning. Okay. So, but um, she would she would light a candle and she would make it so special, and uh, it, it it was beautiful. And um, so. Uh, <laughs> I, I've made her laugh so much in our marriage. I remember the early years of marriage. We were staying this, in this house in Selbridge and um, had a really steep stairs. And I remember one morning early, she shook, she shook, she said, John, the phone is ringing. It was Saturday. And I jumped out in my, bo my boxers. I ran down the stairs because the phone was ringing. Next to my feet went from under me and I tumbled down the stairs, bang, and landed on, uh, uh, you know, on, on the bottom. Thanks for that. I didn't break my, my arm, but I, I really felt very hard. I remember I reached for the phone and went, hello? And all I could hear is this woman he, 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 on the phone. I'm like, that's the weirdest thing. I put it down. I, I went up to Joanna. I was like, ah. Oh. And I get up to the bedroom and she's under the blankets and she's roaring laughing because she had the mobile. This was like 1999. So mobiles was kind of cutting edge technology. I had no idea that you could ring yourself. And so she's roaring laughing. I nearly break my leg getting down the stairs to answer the phone for her. And she's laughing just like that, just like that, right there, <laughs> laughing. <laughs> so I have, I, I spent 20 years making that woman laugh. And, um, you know, it's like the time I was up in the attic. And uh, I, I remember I was walking through, and I got my feet got, some would be thinking you're kind of clumsy, but I got my feet trapped in the wires. And I remember I just fell helplessly straight through the ceiling. And I'm, I'm like, I'm, I remember uh, uh, there was this big bang and there was white smoke everywhere. I said, oh God, am I in heaven? Because I was upside down, hanging by my ankles from the ceiling like a turkey, <laughs> just next to my bed. And there was this white smoke everywhere. And, and as this white smoke cleared, I realized, I was saying, am I dead? Uh, is this it? And suddenly the smoke cleared and I realized, no, I'm in my bedroom. And I remember I went downstairs to Joanna. I was like, I went down and she said, what's wrong with you? You're, you're all white. And I said, because I was, I was snow white. Uh, the, the, the ceiling, I took down half the ceiling with me. And um, I said, I, 
I fell through the ceiling. Her mother was with her and they just started laughing. <laughs> but it's an essential part to a happy marriage. So, um, <laughs> Proverbs 21.9, it's better to live alone in the corner of an attic than with a quarrelsome wife in a lovely home. So ladies, don't be a nagging and contentious wife and vice versa to the men. And to the men, you know, don't be always looking to find fault with your, sp with your spouse. I mean, look in the mirror. You're no Clark Gable, okay? So, I mean, in the midst of dirty nappies and homework and endless washing and bills, take a moment to smile and to laugh and to love because your spouse is God's gift to you. Amen? Romans 14, 7. Uh, Gotta, gotta finish. But uh, at Kingdom God, not meat and drink, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So, you know, don't be a super spiritual, uptight killjoy. Because that's how I describe some Christians. You, you, you know, the Bible says the letter kills. Some Christians, it's just the letter. And, and there's no fun. You're not allowed to have fun. Because, you know, God is, is, the Bible says God sits in the heavens and he laughs. Do you know why you can laugh? Because God designed you to laugh. Amen? If he didn't design you to laugh, when you'd laugh, maybe something would crack in your face or something would go wrong. No, God made you to laugh. It says he sits in the heavens and he laughs. So, amen. How many of you want to be like God? Don't look like you're always sucking lemons, thinking that's being spiritual. Sometimes people think what, some, some of what people describe being spiritual is people just being uptight. Okay, and um, so anyway, the only reason we can laugh is God designed us. So uh, again, learn to laugh. And, and again, quickly, I'm just finished. Uh, lead. Husbands, uh, it says, wives, submit your husbands. Uh, husbands, love your wives. So as a man, you're called to lead in your home. But you can't lead if you don't first follow. You must follow after God because your relationship with your wife is directly influenced by relationship with your heavenly father. You know, uh, Proverbs, uh, tw uh, Psalm 27 and, and verse 8, um, uh, talks about the importance of uh, getting God involved in your life. Seek my face, God said. So pray together. Pray with your wife. Pray with your children. Uh, pray with your husband. You know, uh, and, and again, take that time every day because I believe this is one of the reasons why we see so many marriages in trouble is you need to get God involved in your marriage. Get God involved in your home. And, and we're talking about leading. So men, don't hide behind your wife. You know, grow a pair and lead and take responsibility. Amen. I think that's important because you can't lead if you don't leave. That's why it says, for this reason, man will leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, they two shall become one flesh. There's a time comes when you have to cut the apron strings with mammy and, and leave, okay? Uh, and, and remember, she's not your second mommy. She's your wife. You're called to lead. So, uh, again, it's biblical to leave and make a new home. I appreciate this may be difficult with the housing price, crisis, but where there's a will, there's a way. And that also means that in-laws are out when it comes to marriage. You need to leave your parents and, and start your own home. It's a scriptural principle. Uh, you know, because when we were first married, we rented a house in Selbridge. It was expensive. Um, we didn't have a lot, but we were happy. I remember we didn't own anything. The first thing we bought was a fridge. I bought this really nice fridge, and we used to show it to everybody when they would come to visit. It was our fridge. Look at our fridge. Isn't it nice? See, and we'd open the door and show them how big it was, and it was like, it was kind of a semi-American fridge. Well, it was, and it was kind of a European-sized American fridge, you know what I'm saying? But it was, you know... And, and we'd show people, because it wasn't white, it was gray. We were, you know, way ahead of everybody. But we'd show people our fridge, because it was the only thing we could show them. We didn't own the house, we didn't own anything, but we had a fridge. And it was nice. And, um, <laughs> but, uh, again, it's expensive renting, leaving your parents, but you can't put a price on peace. Uh, so, uh, you know, just, just as I finish, I just want to emphasize, firstly, listen, secondly, learn, thirdly, laugh, fourthly, lead, and lastly, love. You know, the Bible says love never fails. If you build your marriage on the love of Jesus, and if you, like Joanna said, you know, speaking truth in love, you know, introduce the love of Christ into your home. Just because the person, you know, makes a mistake, don't greet them with judgment. You know, greet them with grace. You know, Galatians 5.13, uh, you, my brothers and sisters, are called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. You see, it's, open, it's easy to open your heart to someone whom you know loves you. You know, Genesis 2.25 says they were naked and not afraid. 
So love means you're not afraid to be completely open with each other. It means, you know, even in our struggles and faults, you can be honest and acknowledge, you know, maybe you're struggling. Because remember this, the enemy works in darkness. So when you bring it out to the light, his power of you is broken. And that's why we got to, it talks about being naked and not ashamed. You know, Ecclesiastes 4 in the, in the New Living says, two can stand back to back and conquer. And, you know, this means you have each other's back. I mean, you cover, you don't embarrass or you don't expose, you know, their weaknesses. You love them. You pray for them. You, you, you know, in the midst of their shortcomings, you, you, you strengthen them. You encourage each other. Amen. So again, love must be mutual. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. So again, to a woman, love is affection. To a man, love is respect. And if you will love each other and respect each other, you can literally create a home that is like heaven and on, on earth. Amen. First Corinthians 13, 5. Love doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. And so I appreciate as we finish today, there are people in this place and maybe there have been hurts. There have been offenses. Maybe there's even been unfaithfulness. All I know is this is that love keeps no record of wrongs. That where we have fallen, God can bring healing. And the amazing thing is, He can heal like there's been no scars whatsoever. You see, we can let it go. We can forgive just as we have been forgiven. As the ushers give out the, the elements, we're just going to finish by taking communion. Ephesians 4.32 Instead, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Amen. So, praise God. If Joanna could come up with me here. Thank you, Lord. Maybe we were too amb ambitious in what we wanted to get accomplished today. But, no. Um, at the end of the day, you know, we've given our best today. And I'm sorry we don't have the time for questions and answers, but I think it's more important that we take communion. Because as we take communion, we're reminded of the fact that the price was paid for our sins. And that no matter where we have fallen or where we struggle or, or what's going on or what's growing, going wrong in our life or our marriage or uh, etc. That, that we can find forgiveness, that we can find cleansing, that we can find a new beginning through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why it's beautiful for us to remember Christ in all that we do. Because again, your marriage won't make it without Christ. You can't do it in your strength. You need to do it in His. And so, Lord, we just thank you for your presence here today, Lord. And I thank you for the opportunity for us, Lord, to, to break bread, Lord, and to remember the sacrifice that you made on our behalf in, on the cross. In Jesus' wonderful name.